Happy start of the wintry season, everyone. Kat and I are back for this week as Kat hunkers down in a new province. The schedule is still going to be slightly up in the air as we adjust for new life changes, but our goal is still to get an episode every other week for the time being. Yeah, I don't have a desk yet. So, and if, I don't know if you can hear it, if it's coming through the recording at all, but I am in a big empty room with just boxes everywhere. So it's very echoey and I apologize for the audio quality, Um, but it will be slowly being improved over the next couple of weeks. So hopefully you will hear that come through. Yes, I don't hear anything, so it should be good. Good, because I was worried about that because I can hear myself echoing back (laughs) <laughs> quite significantly so yeah I, we're not like i'm not at least not hearing it so hopefully we're good but yeah just bear with us <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so because of the insanity on cat's end we are going to do a solo episode this week um that i'm super excited to get into so there is no fun fact as it's basically an hour long fun fact <laughs> I'm so excited for this. Yeah. So, with that said, Kat, what do you know about Rebecca Harkness? Practically nothing. Like, pretty much nothing. I know that she's featured... Well, there's a song about her. Yeah. By one Miss Taylor Swift. That's yeah. That's it. That's all I know. Okay. Well, I went into, like, the research with full intentions of just talking about Rebecca but early on, like pretty much like as soon as I started, um, like going in depth about her life, it morphed into finding out pretty much everything possible about her extensive family. <laughs> um, so there's a lot to talk about, including multiple jail times, mental health, society, and just lives full of chaos and heartbreak. Oh my goodness, this is going to be so much more dramatic than I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but so as you said, Taylor Swift has us a song out called The Last Great American Dynasty, which barely scratches the surface of this wild ride. <laughs> so buckle up, Swifties and history nerds, because we're going to go deep, deep, deep down a friggin' nut so rabbit hole. I got distracted because the song immediately started playing in my head as soon as you said the title. <laughs> oh, I know, right? Like every time for me too. I appreciated it on repeat while I was working on this just because I was like, I need to remember what Taylor says in the song versus what I'm actually reading about. Mm, Yeah, in order to compare. Yeah. So I'm going to start with Rebecca and then interweave her family when appropriate since she's kind of the OG muse for this episode. Gotcha. So she was born um, as Rebecca Semple West. Uh, Her name is actually spelled R E B. E K A H. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was born in St. Louis, Missouri on April 17th, 1915, which is pretty much almost exactly three years to the day of the sinking of the Titanic. Okay. I, as soon as I saw that date, I was just like, whoa, that's close. Like that's, that is close. Like that's just kind of crazy to me. I love connecting those mal- like those landmarks in history. Right. So she was the second daughter of the three West children, uh, and they were all raised by nannies with very little parental participation. Mm. This is because their parents, Alan Tarwater West and Rebecca Cook Semple, were busy, wealthy socialites themselves. Uh, So the Semple side is the side that kind of definitely comes from a line of socialites, uh, Mother Rebecca was born to Frank and Anna Semple, where Frank helped find the St. Louis Union Trust Company, which was a major bank that is now a historical site in the city. Yeah. But that's not even the start of the family wealth. Anna Semple's oh. father, William Stewart Culbertson, was one of the wealthiest men in Indiana. He sold dry goods, started his own utility company, and then invested in the Kentucky Dash Indiana Railroad Bridge Company in the late 1800s. He was a super like a super successful businessman to the point that he literally built a 20,000 square foot mansion that still sits in New Albany today as one of the 12 sites of the Indiana State Museum and Historic Site Network. 
That's huge. It's huge. That's massive. Like, that's... Wow. Okay. Right? So, I want to take this second to take a quick, like, side story into the life of William a little bit, as it actually kind of sets up some of the family traits that we're going to see in Rebecca later on. Gotcha. Um, he moved from Pennsylvania to Indiana when he was 21 years old in search of a fortune. Like, he pretty much was like, I want to get rich. I'm leaving. Okay. He started out as a clerk in the local dry goods store, um, but then by 1854 had started this utility company that I mentioned. Didn't leave the dry goods store, though, until, like, 1868. So this okay. man literally ran, like, a whole utility company and worked at a dry goods store. At the same uh, time. Yeah. He uh, was sadly uh, widowed uh, twice and married a third time when he was 70 years old. He passed away in 1892 at the age of 78 with a net worth of $3.5 million at the time. And what year was this again? 1892. 1892. That's a lot of money for 1892. Yeah. So in today's currency, he'd be worth over $61 million. Wow. Wow. He didn't just sit on his money like a Scrooge McDuck, though. He was a major philanthropist of his era um, and even funded the Cornelia Memorial Orphan Children's Home after his second wife. Uh, okay. The mansion that he built in 1867 that I kind of talked about cost him about $120,000 to build at the time, which is approximately $2 million today. Wow. Yeah. It's actually, like, a gorgeous mansion, and it's been pretty much kept, like, exactly how we had it. Um, it's three stories with beautiful semicircular bays that would make it look like kind of like a mini castle if it wasn't for, like, this weird uh. light orange paint color that it <laughs> is painted. <laughs> light orange paint, like a salmon like kind, kind of, of color? yeah. That is a weird color for a castle. Yeah. Like a castle-esque mansion. Um, it's But it is one that I would totally live in with, like, very few changes to the inside decor. Like, a lot of homes and stuff that I've seen, I'm like, oh, my God, this is, like, ugly by now. <laughs> but his is actually, like, the way he had it decorated has actually kind of stood the test of time. Interesting. Okay. I kind of want to see pictures of this. I don't I know will if you, like, have, have the already. I have the um, link to the, like, historical site um, with notes. pictures of it um, in the notes. Excellent. Yeah, and I'll definitely post some on the Instagram as well. Great. Okay, now we'll go back to Rebecca and her more immediate family. Um, so the business side of the family didn't stop with her mom's side. Her father, Alan, was a stockbroker and a co-founder of the G.H. Walker & Co. firm. Therefore, she pretty much grew up with wealth to spare and an extremely social family. So the dad was new money and the mom was old money. Yeah. Okay. Um, so she attended two schools in St. Louis and then was at the Fermata School for Girls in South Carolina until she graduated in 1932. Her childhood was during the height of the arts and crafts movement, so she was pushed slash gravitated towards... The arts, hmm. which is kind of like what the Fermata School was based around, was like the arts. In particular, okay. she excelled at dance and ice skating, which were hobbies that she was started in so that she would lose weight. Wow. Okay. I was going to say, wait, that's so fun. And those two things like play into each other so well because you can like transfer both skills between the two of them, like to lose weight. <laughs> Yeah, like, it was basically like, oh. oh, we want you to do this because you're a little bit on the chubbier side as a kid, so we want you to lose weight. And so, Good lord. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so sadly, though, the for me, um, the ice skating mm -hmm. was pushed to the side. Mm. Uh, because she was actually ended up being the most passionate about dance, especially okay, ballet. Um, she was, uh, like, she was, like... A perfectionist and like dedicated mm. her life basically like at this time to dance right but more uh, about that's going to come up ballet later is... right gotcha. um yeah i feel like ballet is kind of like a perfectionist sort of dance style like mm -hmm. um 
the only kind of dancing I've ever like taken lessons for or anything is like swing dancing, which is so like free and light and kind of, you know, uh, easy going, like light and do whatever. Um, dance, like dance is like a uh, ballroom dancing or ballet or just like, so like rigid for my, like having, not having done them myself, but knowing people who have done them, like they seem like just such like rigid everything has to be just so kind of dance style so if you're a perfectionist already it feels like that's a, a really easy fit for you oh yeah no and like i mean it also depends as to the dance studio you go to mm -hmm. because i went to one dance studio as a kid with like to kind of take ballet and dance on top of skating and mm -hmm. i hated ballet under the old ownership yeah and then once they kind of changed ownership and one of my actual my one of my favorite of the ballet and other dance style teachers um took over like, bought out the school and it, ballet then became a bit more fun that it was like mm -hmm. yes you there's like the technique and yes there's kind of like a little bit of like that more perfectionist hardcore kind of dedication to it if you want to do it competitively Right. But if you're just kind of doing it for fun or whatever, right? Like, yeah, you need to know the technique, but have some fun with it. Yeah, fair enough. Right? So it definitely was very much of, like, a difference of just, like, how the school was run, too. Yeah, it depends on your teacher. Yeah. I gotcha. So after her graduation from the art school in 1932, Rebecca, known to her friends as Betty... Mm -hmm. um which i found interesting cut with the song betty coming in in the later uh, taylor swift album um it's, but that's about someone else though yeah it's about somebody else but i found it interesting that she used that name as well because i think if i remember correctly betty and james are also names like the names of blake lively's kids and then the third kid no many people know what their actual name is so then they were like oh is that inez or whatever right so, mm -hmm. or one, like, one of the female names, people are like, we don't know if that's actually one of Blake and Ryan's kids or not. Right. Where I'm like, okay, is Betty maybe also a nod to back to Rebecca Harkness in a way? Right. Right? Interesting. Yeah. Because um, they're both the same album. They're both folklore. No. Oh, yeah, they are, aren't they? Yep. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm like, hmm, interesting. Like, interesting to know. Uh, but yeah, she is said to have created a group of her female friends that was literally called the Bitch Pack. <laughs> yeah. The Bitch Pack? Yeah. Oh, I like it. So they were known, for, so she was known from a young age to be extremely rambunctious full of pranks, and just a mischievous young lady. It is right. suspected that her behavior is due to the lack of parental guidance and love that she and her siblings grew up without, right? Yeah, seems legit. Um, it's also said that one of the nannies who cared for the children was chosen because she came from an insane asylum. I'm sorry? Like, worked in the insane asylum? Or, like... I'm not entirely sure. It didn't kind of... It, like, my resources didn't, like, specify if they were working or came from the insane asylum. But basically, it was like, if this person was in the insane asylum, then they must be able to handle these children. But that <laughs> depends on why they're in the insane asylum. You yeah. know, like, a lot, I mean, I will say, like, around that time, a lot of people were just kind of getting thrown in insane, insane asylums and people didn't want them anymore. Like, that happened. Um, however... If if you're there because you've been hearing voices, maybe we don't leave you in charge of children until we can kind of, you know, work on some strategies to kind of keep that under control, like manage it, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that one, like, that's kind of all one of like the rumors about the family, like the nannies. Okay, so it's um, not confirmed. So it's not confirmed. It's just like one of the gotcha. rumors that one of the nannies came from an insane asylum in some way, gotcha, shape, or form. Gotcha. Um, but what is, is known is that their mother was too busy with her social life. Mm. And their father is said to have either terrorized or ignored them depending on his mood. Oh, fun. Yeah. Love dads like that. 
Yeah, it's not clear how he may have terrorized the children, but it is evident that each of the kids had had their own ways of dealing with it. Interesting, okay. Yeah, both uh, Rebecca and her brother, also named Alan, were seen Mm -hmm. as wild children constantly acting out, while their sister Anne was very quiet and well-behaved. Okay. Unfortunately for quiet Anne, her debutante ball was a victim to one of her sister's pranks. Okay. The bitch pack had spiked the punch bowl with laxatives, sending all of the quote-unquote respectable girls running to the toilets. Oh my god. I thought you I thought you were going to stop at like spike to the punch bowl and I was like so we've been doing that forever. Sounds cool. And then you said with laxatives like Yeah. Oh, oh boy oh no that's so much worse and i think isn't it it's not even a fun time for anybody that's just bad and i think isn't it that like at like these debutante balls you're supposed to kind of wear white if you're like one of the debutantes to sh- like show like your virginity and your innocence i don't know i don't like oh that's a bad mix if that's the case i'm thinking that's why she would have done it Oh my god, that's so funny. But I think, like, in general, like, you usually wore more pale colors <laughs> to these things. And so if you're <laughs> hang on, having hang on. the runs due to laxatives in the punch. <laughs> Ball dress code. 19, what year would it this? Like, uh, 1930s? Yeah, in the 1930s. 1930. Yep, uh, I just see lots of girls in white and cream color dresses. Yep. Oh, my word. Yep completely strapless gowns yeah a lot of girls in white dresses oh my gosh yep they're all wearing white yeah so like it would have oh, been man. bad <laughs> that's so bad they're all in white or pastels oh no yeah they're practically wearing wedding gowns oh my goodness yeah because like the whole thing like the debutante balls that if you're coming out so then men can like your boy the boys can like then vet you basically like you're now an adult so you, you can be vetted by the boys for who might be marrying you what's that you're an adult time to get married and have the babies yeah pretty much yeah um but then <laughs> there are like one of the other like things that the bitch pack would usually do at events like these would be put to they would get up on the tables and do strip teases <laughs> i can just imagine all of these people's faces when this happened the, the pearl clutching it's just the oh, pearl yeah. clutching oh yeah oh my goodness what chaos yeah So, throughout this period of her life, Rebecca continued to study dance. Uh, She spent time being trained by a ballerina named Victoria Casso before spending a few months at a prestigious dance school in Chicago. Mm -hmm. In 1937, she went on a world cruise with her brother and was asked to leave the ship due to her wild activities on board. (laughs) Got banned. Yeah. (laughs) These antics included... Throwing plates at the ship's orchestra. Oh, no. Okay. Swearing loudly for as long as she could at times. Uh, all right. And swimming naked in front of all of the pool guests constantly. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So she just, like, did not care. No. She was 22. <laughs> She's, like, young and fun and free and just, like, not a care in the world. we will do whatever she wants. In the 1930s. Oh, man. Yeah. At 24, she ended up marrying a Yale graduate named Charles Dixon Walsh Pierce. He was an advertising man where everyone who knew him described him as someone with his head in the cloud, all like his head in the clouds at all times. Mm. He, um, if he, uh, you can actually look at like some of like the Yale uh, papers and stuff, and his name would be like on like the Yale paper, like the Yale like. C- university newspaper um as like editor and working on like the advertising and stuff like that like he was he knew what he was doing from a young age okay kind of a thing right um one of his most famous relatives was franklin pierce the 14th president of the usa wow yeah so she married wealthy and ambitious But she regretted the marriage instantly. Oh, no. 
um, a quote from her, from Rebecca herself. As soon as I walked down the aisle, I knew I had made a terrible, terrible mistake. Oh, shoot. She is that also sucks. rumored to have said that she married him just because she had nothing better to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I sympathize. But when you're marrying someone just because you have nothing to better, like nothing better to do, and then like I okay, that that sinking feeling of regret is that's your fault now. Like that's like well, I'm betting you okay. though that she also it's, had like some push from like the family and stuff, like being like, hey, we're a high society wealthy family. You're 24 and you're causing a pile of shit. <laughs> you need to get married now. No, listen, listen. I understand. She was definitely under pressure, right? Like I get that for sure. Um, but, uh, you still need to be, you still need to have some kind of standard about who you're, who, if you're like who you're marrying, like you're marrying that person, especially back then, it's a lot more difficult to get out of it. So like, it's, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so they divorced in 1945 after having two children, uh, okay. their son, Alan. So there's now three Allens. <laughs> Um, and then a daughter named Anne, so the third Anne. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but Anne was known as Terry by friends and family. Mm. Okay, so now I'm going to take another fork in this road, and we're going to start with the eldest child from this marriage to kind of kind of give a peek into his life momentarily. Okay. Alan Pierce was born in 1940. Mm -hmm. And had as much of a dramatic life as his mother did. At the time of her death in 1982, he was unable to attend the funeral. As he was detained in a Florida jail. Oh, wow. Okay. He okay. was convicted of manslaughter after getting into a fight where he ended up shooting a man. Oh, shoot. It was literally oh, okay. like a bar brawl. Okay, I was going to say, do you know what they're fighting over? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so he served, he only ended up serving eight years in jail. Mm -hmm. But according to Alan, it was the best eight years of his life as he was away from his mother. Oh my God. Okay. So Rebecca is said to have had a similar parenting style to her own parents. Ooh. In fact, it's rumor that she had asked for eight kitchens and 20 baths in her Rhode Island mansion renovation so that she wouldn't have to hear or see the children who were being cared for by nannies. Wow. Okay, like, listen, I understand. It was a different time. We didn't have access to the mental health knowledge and stuff that we do now. However, if your parents messed you up that bad and you hate them and you don't want to be anywhere near them, why on earth would you do the exact same thing as them? I know people do. I know people do all the time. I'll never be able to wrap my head around it. Like, yeah. if if it didn't work for your parents, if you don't have a good relationship with your parents, why would why would you do this? Why would you just do the same thing? I don't get that. I don't get it either. But yes, I am also talking about the famous holiday house which i'll be diving into the history of the house itself closer to the end of the episode <clears throat> but yes it was in in holiday house that there's eight kitchens and 20 baths according to her renovations which is so many <laughs> like that's a lot I can't imagine needing eight kitchens like i'm like i would get lost like what do i need to like <laughs> i'm like three kitchens maybe for a breakfast lunch and dinner kitchen like i don't know <laughs> Each person need their own kitchen as well as one for the staff or something. Like, why? Like, Hi. what? Like, ugh. yeah, it's too many. It's like, oh, I'm going to have breakfast in this kitchen and then I'll have brunch in that kitchen and then I'll have lunch in that kitchen and then I'll have second lunch in that kitchen. And <laughs> Well, I'm going to bet you that there's a dining room and stuff, too, that yeah. you're not even eating in the kitchen. Of course. Like, the kitchen's literally just for food prep. So it's not like she's going in the kitchen anyways. Yeah. Unless she needs, like, a late night snack. <laughs> okay next up however is her daughter terry so Anne, quote-unquote terry pierce uh was born in 1944 just before her parents marriage dissolved okay in 1966 terry gave birth to her daughter named angel and rebecca seemed to become a doting grandmother 
At least she was until little baby Angel reportedly pulled a hair ribbon out of her grandmother's perfectly styled hair. That's it. So her unconditional love apparently just stopped immediately. Messed up your hair once and now you're dead to me. What? Yeah, that, that's just what the rumors are. Uh, okay. That's a hell of a rumor. Yeah. Um, unfortunately for her, um, Terry and her, like for Terry and her family, mm-hmm. um, baby Angel passed away when she was ten years old, as she was born with severe brain damage. Aww. Which makes it even worse that this kid with severe brain damage, yeah, accidentally pulls a hair ribbon out of Is her grandmother's hair, and then her grandmother's like, "See you later, kid. I don't want to have anything to do with you." That's messed up. Like, come on. Like, some grace can be account- like allowed for that. Like, ah, yikes. Yeah. But that's not the end of the strife for Terry. Mm-hmm. Later in her life, her first husband would come back to haunt her as he reportedly took advantage of her on her deathbed. So, on her? Deathbed, yeah. Like, okay, but like how? So Terry passed like- away in 2005 from breast cancer leaving behind a fortune of over $44 million. Three of her friends Ooh. sued her ex-husband, Wolfgang von Falkenberg after her death for constructive Wait. fraud and intentional interference with expectancy of inheritance. I was not expecting that elaborate of a name. It's been like Terry, Anne, Rebecca, and then Wolfgang von Falkenberg. Yeah. It's um, just so out there in comparison. Later on in his life, uh, he actually just he legally changed his name so this is Wolf von Falkenberg. Yep, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. I, I make that makes sense. I'm like Wolfgang. I'm like okay, that makes sense because you're probably Austrian, German, like mm. or whatever. Right? But then when you change your name, just so it's Wolf. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. but it's kind of sick though. I kind of I can back that. I I can kind of get behind that decision. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, yeah, so he was sued for constructive fraud and intentional interference with expectancy of inheritance. The claim was that he persuaded Terry while she was on heavy pain medication to remarry him and then change her will so he could walk away with $43 million, leaving wow. the rest of her fortune to be divvied up between, like, her family and her friends. That's messed up. What kind of officiant is letting someone get married, like, on their deathbed under duress? I feel like that's, like... Yeah. Well, he, like, Wolf was saying that it was, that this all happened the year before she passed away. Oh, mm mm-hmm. But the actual records and everything, it was a month before she passed away when she was high on morphine. Uh, Yikes. Unfortunately, though, the courts ruled against the friends as well as against um, her brother, Alan, who did a separate lawsuit on the same grounds. Right. Um, So they're just like, no, go screw you guys. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But this guy has also been part of many other court cases, especially ones around illegal drug use slash businesses but that would be a whole nother podcast episode to go into the wolf gang as they were literally pretty much known. Oh my gosh, actually. So his name was Wolf Gang. He changed his name to Wolf and then had a group of like friends called the Wolf Gang. Well, that's what the, the media called them. Yes. So that's what the media called them. Okay. Because that's <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. But there's like a whole drug ring that he was basically the ringleader of. <laughs> Oh my god, his name is Wolfgang, and the media just was like, like, you know what, we should call the mob the Wolfgang. Yeah. That's brilliant, put it in print. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so... Creative. We'll jump back to Rebecca's timeline. <laughs> yeah. To October 1st of 1947, to be exact. So, t- about mm-hmm. two years after she divorces her first husband. 1937, you said, not 47? 1947. So 1945 is when she divorced her first husband. And then 1947 is when we zoom in onto the wedding of the year. Gotcha. This time to her second and most notable husband, William Hale Harkness. So for those of you guys listening to this, 
podcast, you'll know from the song, The Last Great American Dynasty, that this is where we pretty much get all of the antics that Taylor's talking about. Okay, so this is the bill that she's referring to in the song. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, However, some of these antics are exaggerated, and there's at least one wrong fact in the song, so please bear with me, because I will be calling her out on the facts. (laughs) Oh, boy. Um, Yeah. Please don't come after us. We like her, too. It's okay. Yeah. Like, I'm a huge fan, but there's facts that were wrong or exaggerated. So, William Hale Harkness um, was born in the year 1900 to an extremely wealthy family who founded Standard Oil alongside John D. Rockefeller Sr. So, yes, like Rockefeller Center in New York, John D. Rockefeller. Okay. Yeah. Standard Oil was the largest petrol distributor in the world until it was forced to close down and dissolve into 34 smaller companies when the courts ruled it as an illegal monopoly in 1911. So Chevron gas stations are actually directly descended from Standard Oil. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That puts that into context. Right? (laughs) Um, then, and then there's, like, other ones that were, I'm like, okay, I don't know these names as well as, like, Chevron, um, that are, like, either directly descended or sub, like, one just, like, removed from Standard Oil. So, William married his first wife, Elizabeth Grant, in 1932, and he had a daughter from that marriage at the time of his marriage to Rebecca, who attended this second marriage ceremony. In 1948, the couple purchased and moved into that now famous massive mansion called Holiday Home, also known as the Harkness House and more recently known as High Watch. Okay. So this was a marriage of money for Rebecca, according to reports from friends and family. For William, it was a possible way of reforming his new bride into a proper society woman. Fun. Good luck. She seems... A little unreformable. (laughs) Yeah. So society saw William himself as like a fool in general. So he didn't have, like he himself didn't really have a good society image. But he's going to reform her. Yeah. One of these reasons is that he even had like an odd hobby of writing and publishing horrible, nonsensical books that could rival Alice in Wonderland in weirdness. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no. Even William admitted that these books were horrid. Really? But he wanted to publish books, so he wrote them and published them. But he knew that they were bad, but he kept doing it anyway. Yeah. What the heck? Yeah. The audacity. I could never. His wife, however, was more or less actually afraid of him as he saw her as a quote-unquote naughty child in need of discipline. Ew, gross. According to people who knew them, William kept Rebecca on an extremely tight leash and tried to control, like, every aspect of her life. Don't love that. In 1948, the pair gave birth to Rebecca's third and last child, a daughter named Edith. In August of 1954, William passed away uh, from heart disease leaving her with even more of a fortune that she, than she had to begin with and her freedom back nice so around this time is when her life seems to have become her legacy her parties that were always huge and of expensive taste became kind of odd without william to rein in her eccentric self into what like high society wanted Right. One thing that she seemed to love experimenting with was color. Hey. For example, she... What's wrong with that? <laughs> well, f- well, I mean, like, I, like, the first one that people were like, oh, my God. I'm like, I don't see what's wrong with this. But I'm guessing, like, at, like in the 1950s, this would probably be kind of seen as, like, what the hell are you doing at this, like, in this kind of social You're circle? You're breaking tradition! Um, but she would, but she dyed the chocolate yeah. mousse desserts blue for one of the parties. Oh, okay, yeah, no, that is odd. That is, I, I do see how that can, okay, wait. I mean, how, like, I can okay, kind of see it, like, okay, maybe she had a theme. How do you get that blue? I don't understand. 
Like, it's neat, depending on, like, the theme of the party, I guess. But, like... Maybe she used, like, white how chocolate? Do you get chocolate blue? I don't, like... My, what? <laughs> Could it have been white chocolate, maybe? I don't know. Oh, white chocolate. That could make sense. That would be a I didn't easier. get her recipe for chocolate mousse desserts. Brown. <laughs> you get blue. I'm like, I didn't get her recipe or anything. Now. Um, <laughs> I wish I could get her recipe, but I did not. Um, I'm a fine one. And another example was that she dyed a neighbor's cat green. <laughs> yes, I said cat. It was not a dog like how Taylor says in the song. Oh, shoot. Okay. Articles suspect oh, that maybe yeah. Taylor Swift changed the animal species because of how much she loves cats. So she didn't want to think about a cat getting dyed a different color. <laughs> yeah. Um, but here's the thing, though. Like, I'm a major cat lover, but I would not have changed that fact for anything if I was writing a song that could be fact-checked. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know why a green cat is funnier to me than a green dog. And I think that's because dogs usually get into, like, gross things and stuff. So I would be less surprised to see a funky colored dog. But a green cat, I think, would surprise me a lot well, more. And I mean, like, the amount of people who will, like, use, like, animal safe dyes and, like, dye, like, their poodle's hair. <laughs> right yeah exactly or like they're little like shih tzu a little or whatever to it, you know like it, like it doesn't seem odd to die a dog <laughs> <laughs> seems less odd shall we say to die a dog yeah um and then there's also the lyric about the pool being filled with champagne that was true okay. but over exaggerated Mm. so was, it, she was didn't, it just like poured into the pool or something yeah so like she didn't fill the pool or like swim in the expensive liquor but rebecca was notorious for cleaning the pool with dom Perignon champagne which i do question the results of said cleaning with it <laughs> what was the thought process behind that i don't know like maybe oh i have this expensive pool like i'm gonna clean it with champagne or i have too much champagne let me clean my pool with it i have too much champagne how freaking rich and fancy do you have to be to ever say the words i have too much champagne i don't know but i'm like also i'm like why is rebecca doing the cleaning she doesn't seem like that kind of person she seems like she maybe drank some of that champagne before she offered to help (laughs) Right? Like, I'm getting a feeling of that there's some sort of mental illness Mm. for sure happening here because I'm like... That's possible. What people say about her and then, like, what these rumors are, like, they don't quite line up unless there is some sort of mental health kind of thing that she's, like, in the middle of the night cleaning a pool with champagne or something, like... Yeah, that does sound like a manic episode, kind of. Yeah. Um, one thing that was absolutely true, though, is the fact that Rebecca did spend her money on the boys in the ballet. Okay. She was known to have various lovers during this time period of her life, um, where she reportedly had interesting bedroom habits. <laughs> I'm not going to get into any of the rumors about that, because I couldn't even make sense of some of the descriptions that her lovers had about them. Like, so, <laughs> by interesting bedroom habits... Well, like, like, there was one of her lovers used some analogy about camels that just hurt my brain trying to figure out what the <laughs> hell he was talking about. Camels. Got it. Okay. Hmm. But it wasn't like that there was actual camels involved in it. It was just an analogy about camels. And I was like, I have no idea what the hell is happening. I'm not even going to try <laughs> to understand this shit. Uh, yeah. I think I don't, like, hmm. Yeah. Like, yep. But the ballet, okay. the, the ballet part is where I want to spend a little bit of the time because it's a crazy story that definitely feels like a Taylor Swift song in itself. Okay. So her love of ballet and music never left her. Mm-hmm. Once she had this massive fortune under her name with no man could to control her, um, she invested fast and invested high up in the ballet world. In 1961, uh, after releasing multiple music scores and songs under her name and on her own dime, which did not go over well. People were like, these aren't good. Um, Oh, no. But she did it. Um, She ended up becoming the sponsor of the Joffrey Ballet. So, like, one of the the top, like, 
top New York ballet companies. Wow. It went really well for both parties. Until. (laughs) There's always an until, isn't there? With Rebecca, there's always an until. (laughs) (laughs) So she decided to start to write her own ballets that she insisted (sighs) that the ballet troupe would perform. Oh. And then she also asked that the company should perhaps be just renamed in her honor. It reminds me of the line from Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> um, no, I'm serious. Where uh, Phantom is has sent them all the uh, no, 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 what is it? Um, and your managers must know that their place is in the office, not the arts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like you're an investor. Maybe you don't. Maybe maybe you don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Joffrey refused on both accounts. And she lost it. But she didn't just pull her money from the project. Oh my god. She instead pulled an alleged Katy Perry vice Taylor Swift move and literally stole the majority of the dancers from his company and started her own called the Harkness Ballet Foundation. Bro. (laughs) So I, okay. Oh god. History really does repeat itself, doesn't it? Yeah. That's, so she's just like, all right, fine. You won't make the dancers dance this ballet? <laughs> Please come with me. And just like, how How do you, how do you, I, I don't totally know that I understand that either. How do you steal dancers? Like they have to make that active decision, right? Like do you just she like, probably was offer offering, more money? Like, yeah, I'm going to say she's probably offering them more money. Okay. Um, Kind of a thing. So... Oh my goodness. But yeah, she burned that friendship <laughs> fast. <laughs> so the Harkness Ballet Foundation had mixed reviews. On one hand, her money yeah. actually went towards some like more established dance companies, which assisted them in making like their marks in the dance community. Um, and then she also mm-hmm. purchased and renamed a historic theater across from the Lincoln Theater making it into, like, a state-of-the-art dance theater for its time, like, renovated with, like, the best flooring and everything like that to, like, really create, like, a mecca, like, a mecca theater for dance productions. Right, okay. Um, So the renovations of that theater took two years from the time of purchase, and the company disbanded a year after the official opening of the Harkness Theater. The disbandment was mainly due to poor reviews of the actual ballets put on by the company. So, okay. So they got some poor poor reviews and they had to just, like, shut the whole thing down there. Because, yeah, well, because, like, like, so the actual, like, dance company part had to be disbanded because there was, like, no one wanted to go see the dances. But it's not the dance... Because it's not the dancers' fault. No, so it's not why? the dancers. So then the dancers went on to like other companies, but like gotcha, the okay. fact, like her putting on her own ballets was quickly kiboshed. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, kind of I thought thing. that like for yeah, I thought that like the dancers were getting kind of the brunt of this, like of no, the bad no, no. reviews and stuff. So I was concerned for them for a second. I was like, wait, no, they didn't do anything wrong. Like, <laughs> gotcha. No. Okay, so the dance company because they tried to put on this play that was. Uh, not good yeah. from the sounds of it. Okay, so then the company's disbanded, but the dancers' reputations were still fine, though. I think the dancers' reputations were still okay. Like, I don't know if they ever got back to like Joffrey level. Um, yeah, but it definitely like would have been a dip in their career for sure. But... Yeah, um, but I hope anybody... she paid them really well. <laughs> oh, I hope so. But yeah, if anybody's interested in more information about the ballet side of her life, I do have a link to a series of videos done for a documentary on the Harkness Ballet Foundation. Um, it's the going to be the top link because um, there it's really interesting to watch. While I love her dance contributions, though, I do want to focus as much as possible on the family itself because there's still even more members of the family to talk about. Like, I swear, there must have been, like, some sort of curse put on this family, like, long (laughs) ago. Because, like, pretty much everyone who had something to do with them has had their lives turned upside down, like, some way or another. I I feel like I almost need, like, a family tree to keep straight, like, who is who and who is connected to who and, like... (laughs) Right? Like, I need, like, a graphic or, like, PowerPoint for this. (laughs) (laughs) 
But yeah, one such member of this family is the youngest daughter of Rebecca's, um, Edith. So I'm going to give a quick warning to listeners. Her story can be a little bit triggering due to mental health reasons. So just keep that in mind. I kind of, I don't go too deep into it. So it's not like graphic or anything, but there is a little bit of mental health talk here. So a lot of the sources that I read uh, blame Rebecca for Edith's mental health issues and her numerous attempts at suicide. I feel Mm. that her illness is probably a mix between nature and nurture. Some people have like addiction and mental health illness written in their DNA. So I see that as a possible reason for Edith as like the whole family seems to have struggled with mental health. That would make sense. A genetic component. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, the way that Rebecca reportedly treated the children would not have helped, but neither would of the amount of medications that were in the household. As I said like a minute ago, Edith attempted to take her own life on more than one occasion mm-hmm. using her mother's medications. Oh. Sadly, um, she did end up passing away from suicide just after Rebecca passed away. Interesting. Yeah. So she, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I have a, so like, yeah, yeah, like basically it's like, I have a feeling that she had an addiction to medications and then had the mental health, depression and everything on top of it. Overdosing. Yeah. Yeah. And just ended up over, like constantly overdosing. Like, and like painkiller kind of medications or like what kind of medications? I think it's their variety of medications. I think Rebecca was taking a variety of different medications for multiple reasons, including mm, okay. like drug drugs and things like that. Like she was notorious for having like for doing weird things to try to keep herself young. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So then Edith self-medicating with the st- same stuff that her mother was using makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Dude. Before her death in in 1982, Rebecca had two more husbands as well. Both of them doctors. Okay. Her third husband lasted about four years, while her fourth lasted about three years. Oof. Oh, no. Um, it is this last husband that I want to touch upon quickly um, because I found an article about him that I actually found really interesting. So his name was... Okay, it's either Niels or Niles. It's N-I-E-L-S, H. Lawrenson. And he was a fertility doctor who was about 20 years younger than Rebecca. They married... Okay, so... Sorry, yes? How... Hang on. How old is she at this point? Like, I've, I've kind of lost track. Uh, they marry in 1974. Okay. Uh, she was born in 1915. So about 60-something? So... If I'm doing math okay. right. So if she's like 60, he's like 40 ish. She'd be 59. 59. Okay. So yeah. if she's 59, then he'd be 39. Okay. Yeah. So they're like getting to, like at that point, they're at the age that like an age gap is like whatever. Like, you know, if you're 40 and you're dating someone significantly older than you, it's like it matters much less because you're both fully developed adults. I was a little concerned that it was like she was 50 dating like a 20 year old or something. I was like, ah, ah, no. okay. But yeah, no. Okay. That's fine. That's chill. Yeah. So yeah, they married in 1940, sorry, 1974 and then divorced mm-hmm. in 1977. So, okay. In 2006, uh, Lawrenson was recently released from a low security detention center after serving five years for insurance fraud. Bro, so much fraud. Why is there so much fraud? Are they all just like, okay? Yeah. Uh, so he lost Everyone's his license. To each other. Yeah, he lost his license to practice medicine, but yeah. still liked to refer to himself as Doctor Lawrenson. Geraldo Rivera, who is like insane himself, reportedly yeah. used to refer to him as the Dino Gyno. Oh my word, what? And literally my notes, I literally put down gag. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't imagine if I had a gynecologist who was referred to as the Dino Gyno, I think I would just leave. Like <laughs> Right? 
It's like, no, we're not gonna. Mm -mm. Yeah. Like, um, this is already uncomfortable enough. Like, we don't need to do this. So, in 2001, he was convicted of billing insurance companies for gynecological operations when he was actually giving fertility treatments. Uh, around this time um, is when, like, as of right, like, in most insurance companies, wouldn't pay out for fertility treatments. Um, a year later, insurance laws did change, allowing for infertility treatments to be billed. Lorison claimed that he billed on behalf of women who could not afford the treatments, but it wasn't oh, wait, clear okay. if this was really the case or if he, if he was double dipping. Okay, fair enough. Interesting. Okay. Because most of his patients were celebrities. Oh. Which makes me like super suspicious because he was actually yeah. introduced, like he was already practicing. Then he was right. introduced to the celebrity world by Rebecca in the mid nineteen seventies, where then oh, okay. he like, where then he basically almost became like exclusive to the celebrities for fertility oh gosh, treatments. Okay. Then I'm like, dude, you can't like I don't I don't see you doing all of this. So, I yeah okay interesting. So so he's trying to spin it like, oh, I'm doing it for a good cause. I'm trying to make sure that people who aren't covered or like who can't get covered for fertility treatment get covered. But, like, actually, like, it's clout and it's, like, just him just trying to make bank. That's what I'm thinking. Like, because I'm, like, yeah, like, most of his patients that I was, like, could, that I could find and stuff, like, it was, like, about how he was, like, the celebrity gynecologist. Right. So it's not like his patients couldn't afford the treatments out of pocket. Yeah. And, like, everybody at the time was paying for it out of pocket. So. Yeah yikes <laughs> yeah that's pretty yikes um okay so rebecca herself uh passed away in 1982 as i mentioned um from stomach cancer mm -hmm. and this is kind of where we kind of get to see a little bit more about her philanthropy because before she passed she put a pile of money towards various healthcare organizations in hopes of assisting with research so the New York Hospital has a William Hale Harkness research building, and she's supported a lot of research into Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. um, her ballet foundation is still going in a way by handing out scholarships to dancers who wouldn't be able to like afford their training otherwise and helping out with like dance schools and stuff to be able to go to do different competitions and like dance schools in like other countries that can't really afford to do dance the way that they would like to that's cool that's really cool to be able to sponsor young artists right but then there's also other things like the fact that when she passed um one of her dear friends salvador dali created this extravagant spinning urn for her ashes that is valued at approximately two hundred fifty thousand dollars for what <laughs> For, just, for a I, um, extravagant a, spinning urn. That's fancy as hell urn. That is a fancy ass urn. I have, I've never seen an urn that needed to be that fancy. That's no offense to people who like okay, like so, art, but is, it is it, it is a what gaudy no, urn. <laughs> like it is a whole. No. I, I can't stand it. <laughs> I need to know is what part of the urn exactly is spinning is like the outside spinning and like the inside is stabilized or something or is it like whirring the ashes like a blender like what is, <laughs> like, what is spinning in the urn is I'm it just like on that, a constantly think, rotating pedestal i think it's like, like on like 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 the bottom of the urn that like you can probably like turn the urn or something somehow like so you can see so all like of the beautiful box. art on the outside of the urn like i don't think it's like a blender <laughs> <laughs> so she's in like a death music box yeah oh my god i will be putting a, vi a photo of it up on like the instagram and then people can like let us know what god, they think please. about this urn because it is ugly to me like i'm looking it up right now i need to see this, this thing oh my god the first thing that came up is a reddit post saying is rebecca harkness has earned the mirror ball <laughs> <laughs> um uh, I, don't, I don't know i don't know about that one. Oh my god that well is i mean atrocious. both spin <laughs> so what part of it's Bins. I don't understand. It's like I'm looking at this gold thing covered in butterflies. Mm. That is the thing that we're talking about here, right? I'm looking at the right one. Uh, no, I that's. Think... Hang on. That's. Yep. 
Yeah. So fancy. She's also like stunning. Holy cow. Yeah, she was gorgeous. She's a- absolutely gorgeous. Holy. But yeah, apparently, like, some part of this thing spins. I don't understand. <laughs> this is like the gaudiest. Yeah, like, I'm like, it would be pretty as like a sculpture. Yeah, but, but as an urn? <laughs> I'm. I have questions. I have so many questions. Well, you can find that urn in the Harkness Mausoleum in the famous Woodlawn Cemetery if you would like to try to f- see if you can get access into the mausoleum to see the urn. Wait, 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 wait. Hang on. I found, I don't know how accurate the source is. It's from the Daily Mail, but I found uh, an image of the urn. And the thing underneath it says, uh, let's see, it says, Harkness arranged to have her ashes stored in an ornate $250,000 urn designed by her longtime friend Sal- uh, Salvador Dali. But her ashes didn't completely fit in the delicate face. Yeah. Just a leg is in there, or maybe half of her head and an arm. Yeah. Said one of her friends to the New York Times, her daughter Anne was forced to tote the rest of her mother's remains in a Christie's shopping bag. Yeah. What? Why not just make it bigger? I don't... Because he'd already made the urn. Apparently oh he didn't God. think about how much room how much, ashes like, take. Ash. <laughs> my guy. <laughs> It is, it is, it is something that I don't totally understand. Uh, well, uh, what are All we right. going to understand about the <laughs> New York social lights of history? Uh, like, I have so many questions. Yeah. Okay. So I did promise a little bit of history on the famous house. Mm-hmm. Pretty much everyone knows that Taylor Swift is the current owner, or at least I believe it's still in her possession. I didn't see anything saying otherwise swift bought it for 17.75 million dollars in 2013 from the previous owners the waddles family the waddles are the ones who actually renamed the house high watch when they purchased it from the harkness family in 1974 Okay. Um, Holiday House itself, though, was originally built back in 1929-1930 for Mrs. George Grant Snowden, real name being Pearl Pinkerton McClelland Snowden. Pearl's husband had passed away in 1918, and mm-hmm. all the family wealth came from... Oil? Drugs? Yep. Crime? Murder. No, you guessed it. Oil and oh. gas exploration. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one oily fucking house <laughs> like <laughs> yeah there's a lot of oil mo- uh, moguls mo- moguls yeah oil investor people yeah <laughs> i don't know um so in 1938 a hurricane came through the area and almost devastated like the private beach area of the home eroding the hillside mm. that the house sits upon yeah. George Grant Snowden Jr. took it upon himself and built like a pile of large boulders to basically like reinforce the land. Oh, okay. When Taylor bought the property, she decided to try to properly reinforce this damaged area. And she got a lot of heat over it by people who swore that she was ruining a public area of the beach. By not letting her house crash into it and destroy it. Yeah, because, like, I guess, like, the beach, like, for a while, the owners allowed public access on it for, like, kind of a thing. But it is private property. But it's technically private property. Yeah, it's technically privately owned. And I will agree that she was in the right to fix it properly with modern engineering rather than, like, random large boulders. That's maintenance. That's, That's a good thing. That keeps the beach from being completely washed away. Like, why... Yeah, but people Would were not want like that. people were pissed because they're like, "Oh no, like, this is a this is a public beach." Therefore, How dare she exist and do anything ever. I don't. Yeah, that's a really um, weird thing to get mad about. But the law did agree, and multiple lawsuits failed, um, and basically where the law was like, "Yeah, no, fucking fix this." Really- like it's a oh, private yeah. beach. People really tried to sue her for maintaining her own property. Yeah. Oh my god. That's that's ridiculous. Why I mm. Yeah. 
Today, though, Holiday House is most well known for Taylor's large and celebrity-filled 4th of July parties that she held from 2013 to about 2017. So, Mm -hmm. magazines compared her 4th of July parties to those like the Vanity Fair Oscar parties and the Met Gala. Like, they were, like, so many celebrities and, like, high, like, it was, like, um, like, uh, the most exclusive list of people who were allowed to go. Cool. But residents complained constantly about the influx of paparazzi in the area during these events, which I kind of also totally get. Like, like yeah, paparazzi are annoying, right? Like they're predat- like it's the most predatory form of journalism, in my personal opinion. Don't come at me. No, I agree um, that it's insane. It's insane, but like, um, unless she's calling the paparazzi on herself, which as an A-list ce- celebrity, I don't see her like needing to do. I don't really see how it could be her fault. Yeah. Just besides, like, she's hosting a party, you know? Like, that's not, like, hosting a party is a morally neutral act. It's not, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's just, like, it's it's, it's the kind of thing that, like, if I were to host a party or you were to host a party, it would be fine. But because she's a big person and it gets more attention, then she's not allowed to anymore? Like, yeah. I well, don't know. Like one thing that doesn't there's only help. There's so much you can do to mitigate that. Is kind of yeah. where I'm coming from. Yeah. Well, because like one thing that doesn't help is that pretty much everyone knows where Holiday House is. Yeah. So fans are also flocking. Yeah, and that's disrespectful, by the way. If you're a fan of somebody and you're showing up at their house uninvited, you're not a fan. You're a stalker. Stop that. Well, fancy you would say that because over five reports of stalkers have been reported to news outlets around the Holiday House property, three of them in 2019 alone. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. It's been a problem. It's it's still a problem. The problem is bleeding over from A-list celebrities to, like, internet celebrities and, like, you know, Twitch streamers and YouTubers and stuff as well now. Like, it's like... It's a, it's the kind of problem that's not going away, and it's not going to go away until we start talking about it. Exactly. So a previous governor um, also introduced the idea of a second home tax for those who have multiple pricey houses in the state of New York. Fair enough. The media dubbed it the Taylor Swift tax. Oh my god, why? Because it was... the only one who owns multiple properties in New York. Well, because I think that it was when Taylor bought... After Taylor bought Holiday House and then these parties started, and that's when the governor was like, oh, we should have this tax. So then everybody's like, well, we can blame it on Taylor Swift. Oh, my God. What? Like, what a scapegoat thing to do. Like, that's... Yeah. I don't... Mm. <laughs> that's um, not cool. It was quickly turned down. Like, it never actually happened. Okay. That um, is, like... So very clearly, like, she's, like, do you know how many, like, rich, wealthy business people live in New York? Like, uh, yeah. That's basically New no, York, unless you're no in, like, sh- in, like, a studio apartment. <laughs> right? Like, well, yeah, like, if you're anybody who's anybody in New York, you probably own more than one building. Like, I don't, like, you can't just be like, oh, Taylor Swift owns two houses. It's her fault we're getting taxed. Like, that's such a scapegoaty, like, like, yeah. Uh, gross. Yeah. In April 2019, um, a car crashed into the house gates during a high speed police chase. Oof. Which wasn't, I, like, I don't think it was anything to do with Taylor Swift, but it's just kind of Happened a note that is now put place. on anything about it that a car crashed into the house gates. Mm. Um, What I'm jealous of, though, is the fact that fans have actually been invited into the house as Taylor held her secret listening sessions at Holiday House in 2014 and 2017 for the 1989 and Reputation albums. And that is so cool. And I've seen stuff about that. That is really, really cool. And that's like, yeah, that's a really, really down to earth way to connect with your fans is to just be like, hey, come over. Let's hang out. Like, that's like, I think that's really, really neat. And this is where I draw the line of. If you are invited, it's yeah. really cool to be able to like meet your meet your you know whoever you look up whoever you look up to and stuff your role models. But don't don't ever don't ever just be showing up without that invitation like right. that. 
<laughs> well, I mean, Clear like, lines of consent, people. It's not difficult. And, like, when I was thinking about that, it wasn't even, like, oh, my God, I would love to be in Taylor Swift's house. Now that I've been doing mm-hmm. this research and I've kind of, like, seen, like, how, like that multiple people have done, like, these kind of renos and these kind of things to this house, I'm like, I want to see fucking inside of this house. Yeah. Like, I want to know what the hell is this house layout like? Like... <laughs> It's like the description of it is so wild. It's How like, many yeah, kitchens like are there now? The like, cool. like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I ends up right, and I'm like, also, I'm like, now that Taylor has control of it, I bet you it's gorgeous, because apparently mm. Rebecca Harkness, her taste of design was pretty gaudy and like over the top. I, I want to know mean, how yeah, Taylor I mean, Swift has <laughs> taken that design, like, <laughs> like I saw the thing the the urn that she decided to like have her ashes kept in like if that suits her like the, the guardian over the top makes sense yeah oh man and then my last fact of this is that in 2022 holiday house was named as one of the most expensive celebrity homes in the americas wow right where i'm like wow that is insane like, do we know like how high up on that list of most expensive is it like 50 most expensive or like 20 most expensive hang on like, i'm gonna look it up most expensive uh celebrity because that could be a really high bar let me see here i don't think it's in the top 10 mm. oh nope so it's number 10 holiday number house 10. is at number 10 at 30 million dollars mm. now like as it's like oh, what it would be mm. sold for now Kylie Jenner is just on is just above her at thirty six point five million dollars. I don't understand how the Kardashians have so much money. I don't get that. I I, I will never wrap my head around it. Um, Ellen DeGeneres is at forty five million. Wow. Tiger Woods is at fifty four point five mil. I can see that. That makes sense. Tom Cruise is at fifty nine million. That one really doesn't surprise me. But that one we could also say is Tom Cruise slash Scientology. <laughs> Good point. Angelina Jolie. Did <laughs> we need to do an episode on Scientology, especially with the Danny Matheson like, trial right now. Like, <laughs> Angelina Jolie is at 61 million. 61, okay. Yeah. Um, wow. That also makes sense. She has a thousand acres of land surrounded by a moat. Her place is surrounded by a moat? Yeah. Um, my thing, though, is I'm wondering if it's... Because I don't think... I'm wondering if she's now fully won this house. Like, this is the this is their chateau in the south of France with their oh, okay. vineyard. Um, but they're just in, like, legal battles um, over, over it with the divorce. It. So I don't know if it would still be hers now. Jay-Z mm. and Beyonce have an $88 million house at number four. Because apparently they need a they need four outdoor swimming pools. Oh my god! Okay, but that's Jay Z and Beyonce, and those yeah. are both huge names in music. Um, George and Lucas. Jay Z outside of the music too. The Skywalker Ranch is a hundred million dollars. Bro, really like threw everything at Star Wars. Like he's made other movies in Star Wars, but to have a property and then name it Skywalker Ranch. Yeah. It's like he had other work that he did too. Well, it's 26 acres and it's a traditional style mansion, apparently. Traditional style mansion. What is a traditional style mansion? I have no idea. George Clooney has a $100 million house as well. I forgot he's um, still around. I'm not going to lie. That's This is their um, Italy one, though. So he's also got multiple. So in the Americas, then, then Taylor would be at least at like number eight or not, like or eight, like seven or eight, because mm-hmm. there's at least two houses of on this list that are not in the Americas. Right. And then number one is Bill Gates' one hundred twenty-five million dollar mega mansion called Xanadu two point oh. Xanadu. Yeah. I want to know where that came from. And what it has Xanadu? a what does Xanadu it's a movie, mean? isn't it? I think Xanadu is a movie. I think Xanadu is a movie. He did not. He does not have the most expensive mansion in the world, and then name it after a fucking movie, did he? <laughs> I think. I guess so. Are you I don't serious? know. 
Um, it's almost as bad as Skywalker. But Ranch. here we go. Here, okay. Here's the thing about Bill Gates's house. Okay, <laughs> mm-hmm. it has golden sand that has been imported from a Caribbean island. Oh my gosh! Why? Famous artwork. Like actual gold. I don't know if it's actual. Or I don't think it's actually like golden, gold, like golden color. Please um, just be golden colored. That's ridiculous. He has famous artwork hanging on every wall. A oh man-made stream filled with salmon. Uh huh. And a giant trampoline room. <laughs> Why? I don't know. That's the most bizarre. Like I'm imagining, like Bill Gates, ultra billionaire, like could be even higher up on the Forbes like top 100 list if he hadn't donated so much already in a trampoline room. I like my, my guy. What? Okay, so Xanadu is a, it is a movie. It's also some sort of cloud or something as well that there, that there's some sort of like Xanadu quantum technologies business. Um, okay. But it, the term Xanadu means an idyllic, exotic, or luxurious place. You know what? Okay, I, I take it back. That makes sense. That fits. But yeah, because like Xanadu, um, there's an Olivia Newton-John song called Xanadu. Okay. And then um, it's a Gene Kelly movie with Olivia Newton-John in it as well. Mm. So he could have picked the term because it meant that, and then also it's a movie because, Yeah. Yeah, Xanadu not, is a. He didn't necessarily name it after the movie. Actually, I think I think you would really enjoy Xanadu because it's a musical fantasy from oh. 1980. I probably would enjoy it. All right, Xanadu, learn something new every day. Yeah, so I'm guessing that he's basically meaning there's like even more <laughs> luxurious than Z- and exotic than Xanadu. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Huh. But yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that is the insane life of everyone basically related. A lot of corporate crime. There's like corporate a lot of, crime. Like white collar crime. There's white, well, we have white collar crime. We also have murder. There, yeah, there was the murder. There was the drugs. Yeah. Well, the murder, the murder was manslaughter. That was like two guys got in a fight. Yeah. Well, but then the guy shot him. I'm like, at the time, well, okay. I, guess I guess you could consider it manslaughter, manslaughter, but like, Seriously, like if, if you have a gun with yeah. you, like guns are meant for killing, like that is their purpose. It's not like someone punched a guy and he hit his head on the bar and he, you know, died or something. That is a little bit more severe. So yeah, okay, fair enough, murder. Yeah, yeah. like you actually had a murder weapon with you. Yeah, exactly. Which I, from what I hear, everyone in the states does, which is wild to me. Yeah. But that's yeah, that that's like such like a commonplace thing it's just like yeah but that's getting into like (laughs) that's just getting into crazy politics that's getting into crazy politics into other territory yeah so yeah that is the story of rebecca harkness yeah wild yeah and then yeah you guess you and i are gonna have to talk and figure out what we want to do for the next episode yeah depending on what's happening in your life yeah the question kind of becomes like, do we go back and still do the origins of Halloween and, like, the Halloween candy hysteria? Or do we, like, go on and accept that Halloween is over and, like, go into Christmas episode? Although, we could pull, like, a nightmare before Christmas and be like, eh, Christmas, Halloween. We could. What's the difference? We could totally do that, for sure. Yeah, because I did find some interesting stuff about the origin of Halloween, like... Um, the festival that it was based on is actually really like intricate. We know like quite a bit about it, so yeah, I would like to talk about that. Um, I need to get a desk. <laughs> yeah, a desk <laughs> would be make helpful. All of this easier. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So hopefully soon. But I mean, in general, we do have lots of stuff that we can talk about. Yeah, we have lots of topics lined up. We do want to talk about them. We're very excited to talk about them. I just made big life changes and need time. You catch up with life now. <laughs> yes. So yeah, we will let you yeah. all know when we know what we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep you all posted. Um, in the meantime, keep an eye on our Instagram. We'll try to keep posting some stuff even when we're not having an episode due to life. Mm-hmm. Yep. But yeah, 
So, and if you're new here and you haven't yet, you can always go back and listen to the uh, first episodes and see where we've come from and, you know, follow us for the journey. Exactly. Or even if you're Y'all old are... here, re-listen to your favorite episodes. Maybe you'll hear something you didn't hear before. Yeah. Yeah. You'll pick up on something new. Or if you're just looking for any kind of background noise, I can plug uh, my YouTube channel. <laughs> yes. Plug your YouTube channel. Watch the vlog on my on my Twitch channel. Yeah, actually. You have to can watch both of us. I think the second VOD is coming out on November 7th at 7 p.m. I can't remember which time zone I scheduled that in. <laughs> oh, um, Lord. I think it's PDT. Uh, but yeah, so, and I think that one has the chat actually on the screen as well. So if you're looking for more um, cat content, w- w- and by cat, I mean me, not the fluffy animal, um, <laughs> then you can find that there. Um, and you'll see Ashley in the chat as well. So, yay. And they are spooky. Spook, uh, spooky cute game is the game that I'm playing through that and we're just chilling we're hanging out it's good background noise um so yeah I'm really bad at self promo but if you want if you go check want me out there or go find me at comedy blast on twitch and uh check out the vods that are still up there but yeah the better place to go will be youtube because the vods do leave after a while on twitch sadly yeah the vods go down after two weeks yeah Actually, I'm gonna I, as I'm speaking about it, I'm gonna check right now to see if the vods are actually still there at all. One is for two more days, so it's not gonna be up anymore. Nope, all my all my Twitch vods are gone. Actually, it's a good thing I checked. Do I have that one downloaded? <laughs> yes, I do. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. All the vods on Twitch are gone. In like by the time this episode comes out, so hopefully I'll be back to streaming soon. I'm gonna come back with a desk building stream. So that I can have a desk. <laughs> We're going to get that figured out. Yeah. Desks are very handy. Oh. <laughs> all right. So, yeah. We will see you guys all next time. Yeah. Thanks for coming and hanging out with us today.